fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren, sitting at the controls. And my co-host today, Mr. Eric, the Dr. Shapiro. How you doing, Al? I'm doing good, you know. It's good, good, good. A very interesting guest today. Without even doing a big introduction, we'll just get him in here and start talking. He's got so much in his life that we can talk about. So, uh, Mr. Michael Caputo, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Alan, for having me. We're... Um, Son of kind of a famous uh, comedian actor. That's correct. And uh, it looks like you wrote a book about him as well, Dear Pat Cooper. That was your first book. Right. Why did you decide to write a book about your father like that? I decided to write a book, and I decided to call it Dear Pat Cooper, because my father wasn't in my life. And it was like writing a letter to him. Instead of saying, Dear Dad, I called him Dear Pat Cooper. And to let him know about the things that he missed out by not being in my life and some of the circumstances and the things that just generally happened in my life that he would have automatically known if he was there, where he could have helped me, uh, talked to me, took me out, the things he missed. It was just so much. It was just so much. uh, It was just so much scandal in the family and his estrangement with his own mother and father and sisters and me and my sister and my mother. I I understood the, you know, I understood the anger that my mother had for him and he had for my mother. I know that people get divorced. They either divorce, you know, and they peacefully and they get along like human beings for the sake of the kids or whatever. But my mother and father's uh, separation uh, was really hell. It was really hell on my mom. And um, I wanted to get the truth out there because my father used in his act or his skit, he spoke about the Italian family. So he's like the Italian comedian, like Jackie Mason was more for the Jewish people in Jewish comedy. He spoke about his mother and his father and his life growing up and the Italian wedding, which was my mother and father's wedding. And he became successful from that. And if anybody was watching him and didn't know me or my family, I would say, wow, what a, what a, what a terrific father, what a, what a terrific family man. And, you know, he was a famous person, and anybody that would want to interview him would interview him. And anything he would say... They would, you know, they wanted to hear what he had to say. Nobody would come to me, ask me or or his mother or my mother. So everything was good. Everything was good for a while. And then as time went on, my father's act became sort of like a bashing act. He started to actually bash people in his own, you know, in show business, other people like Helen Reddy. I know he was bashing her at one time, and her husband actually got on the radio and threatened him physically threatened my father. Um, And he's continued to do that, even with Joan Rivers. Um, But he started to bash our family. And I had a very close relationship and I got a lot of love from my paternal grandmother, unconditional love, which is the hardest love to find, and from my mother. I had two strong women in my life that filled the gap for my father. And what my grandmother did and, and back in the days when somebody was going to perform, could be my father or anybody, the only way you found out was through the newspapers or if you heard it on the radio or something. So my grandmother, I lived in her house. We lived, I lived in her house until I was nine. And uh, we actually, my mother and father lived there when they got married. 
And uh, I was born, and my sister was born, and my father was already gone when my sister was two weeks old. My mother mm -hmm. caught him cheating, and she kicked him out. So now we were in my grandmother's house, his mother's house. And um, so that's, that's how that went for the first nine years. I never remember my father being in the house with me. I was, he was, when I was two and a half, he was already gone out of the house. So I don't remember a time of, my, of a male presence or my father being in the house with me. So the only time I got to see him was when my grandmother took me to wherever he was performing in New York City. And I got to spend a little time with him, but my father was caught up with people who wanted autographs, and I never really got to sit down and just have a father and son talk kind of thing. And then after the show was over, we, 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 you know, whatever. My father did have uh, visitation rights uh, during a time. So sometimes he would pick me up at uh, my grammar school, it was a Catholic school, in Park Slope when I, when I was living with my grandmother still. Uh, when I started first grade, second grade, third grade, and he would bring me to the corner diner. And sometimes I would ask him, could I bring one of my friends from my class? And I would be there with him. And I'd go there, order my usual hamburger and vanilla Coke. And we'd be there, I'd be there with my friends. And I was like very proud, like my father was on TV. You know, everybody in my neighborhood knew that. And I was really, you know, like just, oh, you know, like just taken, back, taken by that. But that's what it was. It was a lunch, he took me out to lunch. He didn't say, you know, let's go for a ride, let's go to the park, just to talk. It was just that way. He'd come, yeah. pick me up, and that was it. After, the, after you know, it was served, dinner, you know, lunch was served. And I remembered, I even wrote that in my book, I remember distinctly, you know, I'm a fast eater, fast talker. <laughs> and I remember eating really slowly so I could make that hour, that precious time, last as long as it could last even when it was just me and my father. I didn't always bring my friends along with me. I did sometimes, because I was proud of him, you know. How did I end up chasing him for 60 years? I just finally gave up a few years ago. I ended on a really bad note. Uh, but I chased him for 60 years. My sister gave up on him when she asked if he would pay for her college. We were in the lawyer's office. He said he would for the first five minutes. And then he backed out because he had an excuse that he didn't like our attitude. So he decided not to pay for our college. So after that, after that, when she was 17 or 16, when he, she asked him that, that was the last time she ever bothered with him. It was only me that went with my grandmother or ended up going by myself as I got older, able to take the trains myself to go see him, popping up on him. He never called me and said, Mike, listen, you know, he lived in Las Vegas. He lived in Manhattan for a while, but then he lived in Las Vegas. He never called me and said, listen, I'm coming into the city. I'm going to be performing at the Copa. I'm going to be performing here or there. You want to meet up? You want to have lunch? No, I always had to be told by somebody or I had to look in the papers myself and then go there on a surprise and just pop up on him. As time went on, I realized he was just, you know, bad-mouthing the family, even though his skit was always saying nice things about the family and sort of in a jokingly way about the Italian heritage and what it was like growing up from my grandmother was born here, his mother was born here, his father was born in Italy, and they were also separated at one time, uh, which was unheard of in those days. But uh, it's when it got really ugly and he started talking bad about uh, our family, who I knew loved me very much and, and filled in the gap for him, was when I decided that I knew I had to write the book when you said um, you said he started bashing as a comedian, was it in the vein of like Don Rickles, like an insult comic? Was that the no, 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 no? He was going at people in a personal sense. I love Don Rickles. He's like one of my okay. favorite comics. He, you know, Don Rickles would rank on the people, and you know, like you know, give the, no, no, no. My father like wasn't roasting, just that yeah. on him. Okay. He was like, in other words, he went after he went after Joan River. He went after Helen Reddy, and he said mm. from a woman. You know, she, how could she be so famous? She came from another country, and, uh, you know, she thinks she's all this and all that, uh, and uh, she gets top billing over me in, in Vegas or whatever. And her husband heard that, and he came on the radio and said, if Pat says something else about my wife, he's going to have to deal with me. And he did that about a lot of uh, performers in his field. And he started to do that about the family. 
And as I got older, my friend, my friend Bill, uh, who was also gay, he was um, a big Howard Stern fan. I didn't even know who Howard Stern was, you know. But my friend Bill used to listen to him at work all the time. So one day, my friend Bill called me up. And my friend Bill says, Mike, 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 your father's on Howard Stern show, and he's bad-mouthing the family. So he wasn't... Oh, so super- you're, you're painting a picture of just... Um- he became bitter and just angry. It wasn't part of being funny. It was just a, just a negative person. Exactly. He became okay. very bitter and hateful and vindictive. So his mm-hmm. act about, you know, once he made it with the Italian wedding and talking so good about his family, once he got to a certain point, then he sort of like went on the other side of the fence and started talking. Maybe he ran out of material and figured this was the way to go. And did, did it go over with the crowd? Was he getting... Like, it sounds like he shifted personas at a certain point. And I'm just wondering if it was embraced on any level or if he sort of was deluded about how he was coming off. No, he always had this hate and vindictiveness all his life mm-hmm. because when I was with him alone and we did get a chance to talk, even as a young boy, he didn't say that much, many things about my mom because I was really young at the time. But as I became a teenager and stuff, he would always say to me, you know, why don't you ask your mother? Or why don't you ask, tell my mother? And I would say, well, how come you don't come over and, and see your mother? And I would start confronting him about certain things. And he would get really angry. And it always would be a lecture. It always would be something about my manners, something about my clothes, something about his mother, mm-hmm. something about my mother. I understood, you know, I understood how he felt about my mother because divorces could be ugly. But how could you say something about your own mother? who I love dearly. She was like a second mother to me. She raised us. We lived in her house rent-free because he wasn't sending alimony to my mother until she took him to court. And then he ended up sending $40 a week, and then it was $90 a week. And he told his own mother, if they're not paying the rent, throw them out. And his own mother said, I can't throw out my own grandchildren. That's what it was like. So I used to hear my grandmother cry to me on the phone as I got older, not as a young kid. What did I ever do to my, what did I do to my son to make him hate me so much? Meanwhile, all he does is talk about me on stage. Mom, my mom, oh, I love my mom, my mom. Um, Meanwhile, never a birthday card, never visit her on Christmas, never nothing on Mother's Day, nothing. Treated her like she was garbage. So we're talking about, um, I think we can use the word narcissist. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, oh, absolutely. I've heard that word used about him so many times. Yeah. So just completely about his own fame and ambition and money and betterment and uh, left you with this this uh, feeling of deprivation. Yeah. And uh, he never was there for me. And uh, so my friend Bill called me up and he said, bash in the family. So I said to my friend Bill, just like this, I said to my friend Bill, I said, Bill, listen, I said, he'd been doing that for a while now. What am I going to do? He says, you don't know. I'm a big fan of Howard Stern. Call up Howard Stern. Call up Howard Stern. He'll put you on the radio. I said, Bill. I'm nobody famous. My father's the famous one. He's not going to put me on the radio. Mike, listen to me. Just call up. I listen to my friend, and I end up being on there for hours. It was the number one rated radio show for that whole year. And I was on there a couple of times. I ended up getting in the studio and all. And then it came to a point my father my father had told Howard he didn't want to let me in the studio. So uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, uh, Howard's sidekick, not Robin, uh, Delabate. Oh, hey, man, I mean, Mike, no, yeah. we can't have any trouble. I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to give you trouble, guys. I appreciate you gave me so much time. You gave me a chance to get my voice out. I said, I'll take care of this. It's okay. You know, so I waited for my father to come out of the show outside in the street. And I sort of like went behind him and I started, you know, yelling at him in the street, saying, this, but oh, wanted, this is who you really are. This, you're a deadbeat father, blah, blah, blah. And he started doing like zigzags, like trying to avoid me. And he almost, he, almost, he almost fell on the curb. He said, yeah, that's what you want. You'd, like, you'd want to put me in front of the car. You'd, you'd want to throw me in front of the car and have me killed. I said, no, I don't want to have you killed. I just want you, I just want you to be a father. He's still alive. I mean, I, I was shocked. I'm looking. And, he just got, and, he just got, and he just got remarried. Right. I was, you took the words right out of my mouth. He's, uh, so your mother is uh, or was uh, Dolores? My mother, my mother was the first wife. Uh, they were separated for a long time. He married the girl, woman he was cheating with. She couldn't have children. Patty Prince. Patty Prince. She couldn't have children. He adopted a baby girl. Never told her. So when my book came out, that's when she found out she was adopted 
That was another war that happened. Oh, oh okay. another war that happened. I heard he, he yeah. had a falling out with them, but he took care of her. He paid for her college. He paid for a wedding. He bought them a house. He supported her husband. Uh, her husband worked like, for my father in the sense that he did all my father's social media. So my father did get mm-hmm. married again. Uh, last time I saw him was in 2017. Okay. I slept outside of his house because I was homeless. Outside of his house in a cardboard box. April of 2017. When he came out at 6 o'clock in the morning when I rang his bell, he was on fire. Not because his son slept out in the street and he was worried about me maybe getting bit by a rat or mugged or killed, but because his neighbors knew that Pat Cooper's son was sleeping on the curb outside his door. Mm. So, you know, I met that woman. He never told me he was going to marry her. I don't care. I don't care if he told me not. And he made her be like the go-between. I said, all I want you to do is to help me so I can get another home again, maybe buy me a co-op or a condo or something in Florida, not even in the city, too expensive, just the down payment. I'll get a job. I'll pay the rest. And he said he was going to help me, and then I never seen him again. He did bring me up to his apartment, which I was shocked for the first time. I realized he had a little dementia. His hearing was completely gone. He was very frail from the six foot two. I remembered always, you know, towering over me and strong and hyper, very much like me, you know, you know, same kind of DNA. We have the same DNA, you know. And I saw a different man. I saw a frail man. And he said, you're lucky I didn't call the cops on you and have you arrested Mm. for sleeping outside my apartment. I said, well, there's one thing you don't realize, uh, Dad, uh, is this is what you don't realize. You know, we have the mayor here, de Blasio, and he made it legal that the homeless could sleep any place they want as long as they're not blocking an entrance or causing a a problem. So I could sleep in front of your building any night I want to sleep, and there's nothing that you or the cops can do anything about. So just so you know that. Okay, I'm one step ahead of you. I made sure I checked it out before I slept in front of your apartment. And the only reason why I slept in your apartment is because the shelters had no more beds. Mm. To what do you attribute, you said with his second family, like it sounds like he was making an effort, even though maybe, you know, this is a severely compromised person to say the least. Why do you think he was trying more at that phase in his life? What is your psychological interpretation? He wasn't trying to do nothing. He just wanted to create a new family and forget that me and my sister ever existed. So, he, so he, it was just a restart for him. It was like a complete restart for him. They moved out to Vegas. He was now wealthy and famous. When my mother was with him, he, well, he wasn't rich. He, he was trying to make it. My mother used to go with him to all the shows. Once she got pregnant with me and she had me, that she wasn't able to go with him to all the shows. And that's when he had the opportunity to cheat on my mother. And he met this other woman in the business. And they ended up getting married, adopting a kid. Uh, and they named her Patty Joe, and they lived out in Vegas, and uh, she got everything that me and my sister should have got. And I don't, I'm not talking about, you know, when people hear me say that, I go, oh, you know, you sound so materialistic, like you only want your father's money. He kept saying that his mother, me, mm-hmm. my mother, everybody wanted his money. No, as a five-year-old no, that didn't boy, cross my mind at all. Yeah, as a five-year-old boy, as a 10-year-old boy, as a 16-year-old boy, I wanted my father's attention. I didn't want anything. I didn't know anything about money at five and at 10 years old. I wanted to get a gift from Santa Claus at Christmas or a gift from my father when I graduated high school. I wanted to get something I could say my father gave me that all the other boys in the neighborhood got from their mothers and father. I didn't want his money. I didn't want him to to buy me a brand new car and lavish me with gold chains and whatever he ever cock and bull story he came up with. You know, over the years, that's why my sister wanted nothing to do with him. She ended up becoming, you know, getting the three master's degrees and then becoming a teacher all on her own. And she had to get financial aid. But she did everything by herself. And she oh, she got on the Howard Stern show, too, because I told her to call in after I got done calling in. She just wanted to make people know that he had nothing to do with her success, that he never gave her a penny and he refused to help her. And she got every place where she got because of on her own doing so it got really ugly. It got, it got really ugly with him with that. And I wanted to write the book. And I am forever hold Howard Stern in very high esteem because he's, and my friend Bill, of course, who's no longer with us, uh, 
he uh, was the one that uh, did that, and Howard Stern was the one that gave me the voice that I actually could be heard. And then once I wrote my book, I ended up getting on the Geraldo Rivera show because I was an intern on that show. Nobody even knew that I was Pat Cooper's son. I didn't get the job as an intern because I said to them, listen, I'm Pat Cooper's son. Can, you give me an, can I be an intern here? Nobody knew. But I kept watching the calendar on the, on the producers in the room where they had the meetings of seeing what the themes of the show were going to be. And when I saw one up a month in advance saying, can fatherhood be forced? I went over to the producer, and I said to her, she, what's that going to be about? You know, the producer show, she, and she started saying, you know, about people who had children out of wedlock and stuff. But I said, oh, very interesting. Well, fathers who were deadbeat dads. So, hmm. so I sat down next to her, and I said, so listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm Pat Cooper's son, and she looked, left with her mouth open. And as I was telling her this, I said, I would love to do a segment on the show if you think that I would be fit for the show. She reached on her desk and she showed me a post up and she said, we've been trying to get in touch with the Pat Cooper family from the Howard Stern show and they wouldn't give us any of your telephone numbers. Oh, wow. We wanted to get you on the show. And little did I know you were working here as an intern. And that's how I ended up getting on Geraldo's show. And anybody could watch that video. It's got 54,000 uh, views on that how he acted and humiliated me and my family on the, on the Geraldo Rivera show that even Geraldo told him to keep quiet, that he was even making him sick to his stomach. So everything that I wrote in my book could never be, my father could never say was a lie or untrue because everything in my book is all captivated on audio and on video. So that makes my book very legit and very true. If I didn't have that to back me up, my father could always say, oh, he's exaggerating, he's lying, it's not true. But all that's all documented and true. And I got a website, dearpatcooper.com, which is, I never knew a second book was coming. And I didn't want to write about my sexuality in the first book because I felt it would take away from the, what I was trying to accomplish with my first book. That's why I, I ended up writing a second book, just strictly about my sexual orientation. My father's hardly even spoken about in my second book. But the whole book is all about him and our lack of fair of relationship. The first book, the title is Dear Pat Cooper. The second book came out last summer. Right. It's called Chameleon. And tell us a little about that. Okay, Chameleon. Uh, I came up with that name, uh, Chameleon, a memoir. Uh, I didn't want to call it just Chameleon because then I knew if anybody Googled the word Chameleon, they'd have every reptile book about chameleons come up on Google. Chameleon representing the reptile that changes colors and adapts to its environment to protect itself. And I feel that's what I had to do as a young man growing up. I feel that's what many people are still doing today. Uh, it was called closet cases in my day. But I called it chameleon because I think that represents uh, men living a double life and how I had to do that in order to survive. Even though I was still, you know, had gay slurs thrown at me. I was gay bashed at a club. They knocked out like three of my teeth and all that stuff. And my father turned around and told me to gum my food because he had to pay all our dental expenses until we were 21. And this incident happened to me at 20 years old. And he said, I called that club up. I know what kind of club that club was. What are you doing in that kind of a club? I said, well, it, you know, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do nothing. I just was, it, was, it was in like sort of like a darkish room. He said, well, you shouldn't be in a club like that. He said, I said, well, I'm having trouble eating. And, I'm gonna, and he said, well, I gotta, it's going to cost a lot of money to pay for those uh, crowns. He said, and if you can't eat, he said, then gum your food. That's exactly what he told me. And that's when he had a lot of money, a millionaire. This is what he tells his own son, to gum my food. Never worry that I could have got stabbed and killed in the club, okay? Didn't, didn't say anything about that or call me up and say, how you feeling? He was more worried about and had his second wife, Patty Prince, call up my dentist and give my dentist a hard time about what's the bill about and why is the bill so much money? And those days, crowns were only $500 a piece. Today, with implants and regular crowns today, crowns are $2,000 a piece. And implants are $5,000 for a tooth. He had to do six teeth. And he was crying the blues because it cost him $3,000 to, 
to crown six of my teeth and put a bridge. Is this one of the, uh, cause I'm looking into uh, chameleon. It's a collection of stories mm -hmm. and encounters. Mm -hmm. Is that something what you just shared? Is it included in the memoir? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Tell us. Uh, so what are a couple of the other key memories from this, uh, uh, from this book? Um, well, growing up as a teenager, like I said, uh, um, on my block, when I used to live in uh, Kensington, Brooklyn, um, I had a girlfriend. I had a girlfriend for four years. I, was, I gave her a pre and gay. I was going to marry her. I truly was in love with her. Maybe it was puppy love. I truly was in love with her. We had intimate relations all the time. But I, liked, I, liked, I knew I liked guys. I fooled around with a couple of guys in the neighborhood. But there was a group of guys in the neighborhood that I couldn't even walk down the block. I was like the pariah of the neighborhood. Called me faggot, queer, uh, a gay bird. I mean, you name it. Any, any, any name that was out there, they called me. You know what I mean? Because in those days, guys used to be in the streets playing football, touch, touch football, stickball. And back in the days in Brooklyn, and I was never in there. I was in my front garden doing my mother's gardening. Because I was into, you know, I was into horticulture and plants and everything. And they would call me a faggot because boys aren't supposed to like flowers and all that stuff. So, you know, uh, I got the name. Even though I had a girlfriend, I never seen them with any girls. I had a girlfriend walking down the block that I knew I was having sex with when we were a teenager, holding her hand walking down the block. But I was still, you know, they would call me queer. I'd have to sneak out my backyard and jump over the fence so I didn't have to walk down the block and hear their BS all the time. So I heard the word queer and fag like that, and now that, you know, like I said, the, the younger generation is trying to reclaim the word queer. It's like, it just makes me cringe, and I understand that, you know, the world changes and things change. But, you know, to me, you know, you know the words dyke and queer and faggot and homo and all that stuff, it's almost to me like the African-American uh, African community wanting to reclaim the N-word. That's the way I feel personally about it. I'm not down with it. I quote the queer community. I go along with it. But I wrote a lot about that in my book, about how I feel about that. But the torch has got to be passed. This generation has got to take care of what we took care of in my day. You got into the news again. Yes, I did. So after the Pat thing, then you got into the news again. And so you were, you were doing a massage. Yes. Um, now, now you were doing it for a hotel. So that's like a, it was a legitimate massage. This was right. no, no, supposed no, no. to be. Yeah. I'll give uh, one you know. of the background about that story. That was really uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I found that interesting because she, um, you kind of got, like I said, you got in all the headlines again. I got in the headlines again. That happened by accident. Um, I was, uh, doing massage at the hotel. And it was a five-star hotel. I worked on a lot of celebrities. Uh, it was a Peninsula Hotel on Fifth Avenue. In, uh, and we were the only game in town at the time when I started there. In 1993, I think it was, when I first got my license, they hired me. So I was with them until 2000, 2008 from 93. Got to work on a lot of people, hone my skills down, uh, highly requested. And I would be, end up becoming also, a, I was a licensed massage therapist, nationally certified so I could work in any state. You had to be licensed back then because if you weren't and you did massage, even though they had all these massage parlors, every other corner, every other manicure place, or they would call it a massage or a spa, they were all illegal. It's a felony to do massage without a license. So I kept my license always up to par, and I was doing legit massage. And I was written up in three major magazines, which Allure being one of them. They wrote me up twice as one of the best massages in the country. And um, I ended up becoming a licensed esthetician also, so I did skin care there. Then I did some management work there, and I also did payroll for the uh, massage department. So I was very well known at the peninsula. And a lot of celebrities, like I said, I worked on a lot of celebrities, uh, Jennifer Lopez, Ricky Martin, Julia Roberts, to name a few, some sports figures. I don't know too much about sports, some models, Alvin Ailey Dance Company. So I got really, I'm very honored and very uh, pleased to have a, had a great career with it. Then they uh, laid everybody off because they were going to do a major renovation because a lot of other hotels caught on that if they have a good spa, they can make a lot of money. My place was making millions of dollars per month 
just in the spa alone, which was run by a management company. The, the hotel did not run the spa. They were our landlord, but they were, we were run by a management company. So the hotel wanted to close the spa for a while, do a major million-dollar renovation on the spa, and then they wanted to run the spa. So I was out of a job. I was collecting unemployment. So I said, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I had, you know, I had seniority where I was. I was very happy making a good living. And uh, I was living in Forest Hills and everything. So I decided I'm going to have to get private clients. But I don't want to go out. I don't have a car to go to people's homes. So I started putting ads up and, having, and doing it in my apartment. So what I did was I did massage in my apartment, okay, and I advertised myself as a licensed massage therapist. So I had to put myself in the pool with all the people who weren't licensed. So that put me in a very, you know, shady area. But it was a way I could make a living, and I made the best living I made in my whole life. I did that for five years. And I turned the skincare. I wasn't doing waxing at my house or doing facials at my house because it involved equipment. So what I did for the men was body grooming, manscaping, for men who didn't want to get waxed or men who didn't want to remove all their hair. They just wanted to get their hair off their back. And then if they had chest hair, they just wanted it cleaned up. So I did everything from the neck to the toes. I didn't touch anybody's. I wasn't a, a barber, so I wasn't allowed to touch that. I didn't have a license to do that. And I became very popular in that. During that time, you know, when I was at the Peninsula Spa, John Travolta had come into the spa many times. And when I was manager there, and I was doing, you know, I did part-time management there, I was also doing massage, but I would come in to do payroll, which was every two weeks at the spa, and those were days I didn't do massage at the spa. I just came in to do payroll, and that took me three to four hours because we had about 45 massage therapists uh, that worked at the spa. That's how busy we were. 45 massage therapists, male and females. So I used to have the male massage therapists, I guess they were the straight ones, would come to me and say to me, I don't want to work on John Travolta. I said, well, why not? What's, what's going on, guys? I worked on famous people. Well, it's the way he acts on the table. It's he's trying to, you know, he's, he's masturbating on the table. He's raising his, his butt up in the air. I said, what do you want me to do about it? I says, you know, I'm a gay male. What do you want me to do about that? Tell the manager. Tell what's her name. You know, I don't want to mention her name on the air. Tell what's her name. You know, so when I went in there and I discussed it with my manager, she said that she was very well aware of that, and she made the hotel management aware of what John Travolta was doing and how the massage therapist did not want to work on him because of his shenanigans. How, how many, many of the uh, different? I heard that. The different I, I heard that from three or four male massage therapists at my place, and they weren't okay. and they were not gay men. Everybody knew at the peninsula I was gay. I didn't hide that at the peninsula. Was it unusual um, in general? I, I'm curious about this as far as massage therapy goes. Is it unusual for men to request men? That was something else I read. No, no, no. He, no, no, no. So that's not, that in and of itself is not unusual. No, 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 no. There's a misconception with that. Okay. When, my, when anybody called my hotel, you called my hotel, you wanted a massage, okay? So you called for yourself. Or you called, maybe you wanted, you were calling to get a massage for your wife for an anniversary gift or something. You said, I'd like to call, I'd like to book a massage with uh, uh, Michael Caputo uh, at the Peninsula uh, uh, next Friday. Is he have any availability? So first they would say, if you didn't request anybody, the first thing they would ask you is, do you prefer a male or a female? Oh, so it's on the question. So it, it has to, you have to ask that, okay? You have yeah. to ask that question. So a lot of men were comfortable enough to say, it doesn't matter to me. And a lot of men sure. say, no, I definitely want a female, okay? God forbid if you made a mistake on the ones that requested a female and they ended up with a male massage, we had a couple of uh, loud mouths uh, at the, went off at the front desk because they made a mistake in booking them with a, a, a male when they wanted the female. And they would use the Got F it. word. I was like appalled in a five-star hotel to hear that crap going on. Right. So what people were saying about Travolta was he didn't um, necessarily make a verbal overture, but he was doing what I, I was reading stories about this earlier before we had you on. Um, the telltale signs of testing the limits, like you said, 
putting his behind in the air or maybe touching himself, things like that. Those were the and, stories and sh- that were going and shaking, and shaking his towel off of him because you had to be draped. By law, right. New York State law, you had to be draped. So we draped people not with a towel. We draped people with one sheet, a blanket, and then another sheet over that. Okay? So three layers. He, three layers. And he would be shaking that off of his body. Oh, but you yes. never, and I'm just, I'm just asking, uh, I'm not drawing any conclusions, but you never worked on him. I just never, the exactly, exactly. Okay. I never worked on him. Okay. So the bottom line was I was home one day and I saw on the news all this crap about John Travolta, but I never got involved. I didn't call anybody. I didn't care. I knew, I knew, right. I knew it was truth, but who did? And these, these out accusations of there. you the things you saw in the news weren't coming from the peninsula. It was other stuff. No, it was, it was, it was no. actually coming from a uh, massage therapist. Some were licensed. Some were not licensed. Okay. Uh, and it was coming from around the country at different places. Different places in a handful, like three, right. three or something. But stuff. they were called, okay. they were called John Doe 1, John Doe 2. Nobody would give their name on the air. So when I right. guess somebody okay. in the media must have Googled massage therapy and being I was written up in magazines and I had ads online advertising my business and I right. said on my I had a whole website built by GoDaddy cost me a couple of grand I put that I worked at the peninsula I had this much experience with 10,000 clients and that's why I got a big following so the whoever found my name they knew I worked at the peninsula because it was on my website so they called me up the Daily News said, we would like to interview you about your work. So I said, okay, very nice. Where'd you find my name? Mm-hmm. On the internet. Okay. In light of the John Travolta controversy, do you know what? Uh, so as it, it turned yeah. out, you knew, as it turned out, you had heard some things. So you never, you never went out with the story assertively. You were contacted by the press, Absolutely. and as it turned out, when they when they reached you, you had had some backstory. Around and they this. and they and the reason why they 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 had me fooled because they made it look like they just wanted to do a story about my career, and right. also at that time I knew my book had my first book was just released. So I said, okay. what better opportunity is this? During the when they're talking about my massage. I'm going to mention I'm an author, and I'm Pat Cooper's son, and I wrote a book. And sure. I figured that would be good publicity for my book, too. So I went with that. Right. But they wanted... So this is, this is 2012. It's 10 years ago. That's... It's pre-Me Too. So the mentality around this is different. Like, we haven't seen a great deal of this at this point. It's more sporadically you'll hear something about a celebrity, and this is one of those cases. And it also got, got handled differently and it went less far at that point in time right but at at the current time now in 2022 when you uh, get publicity for one of your books or you're on an interview like this one this story is part is it intersects with your story in the media so i'm just i'm curious if you're okay with that if you wish it hadn't ever been made so much of or where are you at with that well I, i i was scared because you know to be honest with you uh, I wanted to do the interview with them because, you know, not because I wanted to be a whistleblower, not because I wanted yeah. to out John Travolta, because it was no yes. secret okay. that John Travolta is bisexual or gay, but he's also part mm-hmm. of Scientology, whether they call that a religion or a cult. I don't care. It doesn't make a difference to me. But they're not down with homosexuality, like I had said earlier in the interview, with any religions. Most religions are no. So, you know, he can't be homosexual. And be right. And when you say yeah. when you say it's no secret that he's homosexual or bi, you mean in terms of things that are are often said about him, like he well, himself. Well, I know what, has well, always I, maintained that he's straight, right? Well, that's what I that's what I had heard on TV. He never came out and said, you know, I never heard him talking about his sexuality. But what I heard what went right. down in the news, and I knew for a fact what went down at my hotel. That's the only way I knew it was true what these other massage therapists were saying because he was doing the same thing in my hotel when his wife and kids were one floor below in the suites. <laughs> he was up in the steam rooms hanging out with the guys, you know, doing, you know, J. Owen in the steam rooms that I caught him. Oh, so I caught him doing that, that with my own eyes. And yeah, okay. I also, I saw him. I saw him do this. I didn't tell the Daily News that part. 
But I did tell the Daily News that the other massage therapist didn't want to work with him. The way the news... So, put so it you on witnessed... The page, you, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Good. You witnessed firsthand Travolta in the steam room, self-pleasure? And, and the sauna, in the sauna, yes, yeah, the sauna. In the sauna. The sauna. dry one, yeah. yeah. Oh, so this with is other you people. Saw I saw that with my eyes. Yes, I did. And I, and I, and I knew that that was going to happen because when I had walked to go to the bathroom into the, in the men's locker room, very plush locker room, uh, I went in there and he was there with a towel wrapped around him and he looked at me and he, we, you know, he was older than he was very, he didn't look like he looked like a Saturday night fever, that I could tell you. He was very heavy. <laughs> but he was like, he didn't say nothing to me and I didn't say nothing to him except, you know, good afternoon, sir. I didn't even call him John Travolta. I made believe like I didn't know who he was. Good afternoon, mm -hmm. sir. And he had a towel wrapped around him like, like his tongue was hanging out looking at me. Seriously. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but I just, uh, I, just I went to go, I went to go urinate into the urinals. And I said to myself, mm -hmm. I hope he doesn't come next to me. He didn't. Right. He walked, past, um, he walked okay. past the urinals through the glass door. And I said to myself, I bet you he's going in the sauna. So I knew the water fountain was back there, and there were other guys back there. When I opened the door, I heard the shower on. Travolta wasn't in the shower. He had gone into the sauna. But when the guys who were taking a shower, and there was a lounge chairs back there that were lounging back there, and saw Travolta go in the sauna, what do you think they did? They followed him into the sauna. Mm -hmm. Now, they might have been gay. I know one of them definitely were gay. I know one of the guys were definitely gay. But they followed him into the sauna because they were going to do a circle jerk. And I, I you, knew, you, knew, you knew that for a fact, that that's what went on. That's the ritual. There's no doubt about that. In most, of, in most of the saunas and steam rooms in New York City, I know for a fact. I know what goes on all around the world. And in this country, men have sex with other men. Uh, straight men have sex with other men in the saunas and the steam rooms. There's no doubt about and that. You, I've seen that my whole is life. Is this the story... Is this the story you share in Chameleon, or is this the first time you've shared this? No, I wrote that all in. I wrote that all in Chameleon. So this is all in Chameleon. Yeah, and, so, so um, I'm just putting up to how I got I, how I got on how I got on the first page of the, of the thing. I'll tell you how the media, how I felt the Daily News twisted it. So I asked okay. them if I could bring a friend with me down. They wanted to come to my house. They told me they would pick me up in a limo. I can go to any restaurant I want in the city. They wanted to do the interval. Was I up to it? I said, absolutely. So I said to them, I never worked on Travolta. Why do you want to talk to me about my career and Travolta when I never worked on him? I worked on other famous people. Well, we just would like to talk to you anyway. I said, can I bring a friend of mine? He worked on John Travolta. I said, mm -hmm. you know, he worked on Travolta. Travolta didn't try anything with my friend because my friend, even though he's gay, he wouldn't have taken that. He would have told him, if you don't stop, I'm walking out of the room. Because that's what you're supposed to do as a life as therapist. Anybody acts aggressively or does acts anything in a sexual manner, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to walk out of the room and terminate the massage. Done. Okay. Yeah. A couple other things. That, that behavior, as just described, you said New York law said you have to remain draped. And if you have... If you violate these policies, it's time to walk away. Does this behavior, at least in the context of New York, did it rise? It rose to the level of criminality. No doubt about it. Okay. No doubt and about it. And also, do you feel now? Now the culture has changed around these sort of uh, allegations. Do you feel Travolta should have had any career repercussions as to this behavior? No, because his, his lawyer, he pays his lawyer lovely, and his lawyer put me down in the newspaper saying that I had just had. Uh, I just was trying to get back at my job or something. I had a, you know, I had a bone to pick with my job at the peninsula. His lawyer didn't know anything about me. I love that job. Mm -hmm. I will, you know, I, I, I love working at the peninsula. They treated me very well. I wore many hats there. So his lawyer just was trying to discredit me because Travolta, you know, he probably paid his lawyer a good penny to get him out of that because he had so many allegations going down uh, at the time. But the way the news tricked me was this. I told the Daily News they recorded it, and they, and they videotaped me, okay? And they did that to protect themselves. I told the news at that table, and they were trying to get us drunk. I don't drink at all just because I don't like to drink, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they have the waiters come and bring him more liquor. Bring My friend was having some wine, and they were trying to quiz him. And he said, John Travolta never tried anything with me. He, would, he wouldn't do that. My friend was a very seasoned massage therapist, 
okay? And uh, he was also written up in major magazines. So Travolta wouldn't have gotten away with that with him. But a lot of the other therapists that he tried to get away with were people on the job that were kind of new. They weren't as seasoned as me or my friend was. So he was able to get away with that behavior, and those people were afraid to really kind of report him. So that's why they came to me, because they knew I was gay, and they wanted to ask me, what should we do with this, Mike? And I said, go to the manager. And then when I went to my manager, I already found out that she already knew, and the management of the hotel knew, and they did nothing to reprimand John Travolta. You know why? Mike, you know what the reason why is? Because John Travolta brought in hundreds of thousands of dollars of money to the hotel. And all they had to do was, the, the, the paper said, what really annoyed me was the paper said that I said that the hotel banned John Travolta. The hotel never banned John Travolta. They should have, but they never banned John Travolta. The massage therapists got together as a family, as we got together, and said to me, I told the manager that I don't want to work on him anymore. So if he comes in, get somebody else to work on him. I'm not working on him. They banned him from working on him. But the Daily News twisted it and said the Peninsula Spa banned him, and that's how I got on the front page the next day because my friend, they interviewed my friend with me at the table, and my friend said we're talking things about Travolta, and they kept trying to pull more information out of my friend but my friend didn't, said I worked on him. He didn't try anything with me. And I told them that I didn't work on Travolta, but I told them what my colleagues had told me. And I knew it was true because my manager told me it was true, and the hotel knew it was true. So the next day, when they wrote the story and I made the front page of the Daily News, they didn't even mention my friend's name, who worked on Travolta. They only talked about me because they knew that that was going to sell papers and that was going to be a major scandal. And that way, Wait, so is there part of you is there part of you that would have preferred for your friend to be quoted saying like he, he I think you just said he worked on Travolta and nothing happened. Right. They didn't yeah, mention so that. Would you would you prefer if both sides of the story were covered? Absolutely. That's why I brought him along. Okay, so you in other words, and don't let me put words in your mouth, are you saying that even though your name is, has been tied to Travolta's around this story in a way that's uh, out in the open, you're not necessarily ride or die with the idea that Travolta should be completely accused, or am I getting that wrong? Uh, well... well... I mean, would you have preferred if there was more ambiguity in the way the Daily News told it? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, because the, the Daily News told the truth of what I told them. They told the truth. What they did was they just twisted just that one thing of me right. saying that the other massage therapists band together said they weren't going to work on Travolta because of the shenanigans. Instead, they knew they would get more, more coverage and more, uh, you know, they would get more attention if they turned around and said that the Peninsula Hotel banned them because they're a brand and they're a well-known five-star hotel. You know what I mean? Instead of saying that Joe Schmo, who's a massage therapist, because then they could just turn around and say, well, he's probably lying. Joe Schmo is probably lying, just like all those other therapists around the country who are accusing mm -hmm. Travolta of this kind of behavior. Oh, they're John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. They're not even licensed. They're lying. So when they got me and I was willing to give my name and tell them the truth about this, they had a licensed therapist, they had a five-star hotel, and they, had, and they had a name. And they flew with it. And I must have got a call from every news media outlet, Entertainment Tonight, the National Enquirer I was in, a People magazine wrote something up about me. I mean, everybody wanted to fly me here, bring me here, ever since that hit the front pages. And I told did them you, Did you embrace it, or you just you didn't want well, to? Well, I, I, really, I, got, I got really scared because I thought to myself, maybe, yeah. maybe John Travolta is going to try to sue me. For defamation. Yeah. But I said to myself, let him sue me. First of all, I got no money. Second of all, I didn't lie. I know my profession. I'm a professional and I'm a licensed therapist. And I know what I saw with my eyes in the sauna, which I didn't even mention, which I should have mentioned to the Daily News. Okay. And I'm mentioning it now on this show. Okay. And I mentioned it in my book. So it's no secret anymore. There's no way in the world that John Travolta is straight. Absolutely 100%. 
Not true. I don't know why he keeps it a secret. I have nothing against him. I'm not here to out anybody. But I worked in a profession that I, is considered a healthcare professional. I'm not a hooker. None of us at that spa was a hooker. And I stood up for my colleagues to let everybody know that we are healthcare professionals. We are therapists. We are not masseurs or masseuses. Okay? And that's why I stood up. And by doing that, it kind of backfired on me. You know, people even at the hotel, not the hotel, people leaving at the spa, you know, when I showed up a few years later, were angry at me that I even mentioned that. You know? And I uh, well, you're saying within within the profession there was a backlash yeah, because among people I, who I, you, I looked at the I looked at the guys and said you were the same guys that came to me complaining that you didn't want to work with Travolta and now you're sorry that I went that the news called me up mm -hmm. and wanted to interview me and I told the truth now you, is I, there I, any I, part of you I, I, we have to wrap it up because we're we're out of time wow. but is there any part of you that wishes, you know, I'm getting the different dimensions of it. You were standing up for your profession. You're not here to lambast Travolta. That's not your motive. Is there any part of you that wishes that the story never blew up this big? No, because it really had no effect on me at the time. Okay. No so so it was me. just, you felt you were telling the truth. Yeah. And that was it. That was, was it. it. Yeah, that was, yeah, those were the that dimensions of it. Okay. Yeah. I didn't want to have, so, well, I didn't I, want to have. So, so, Chameleon sounds like a fascinating book. Yeah. yeah. And 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 how hung is John Travolta? <laughs> that that I that I don't really know because all I did was take a peek into the sauna after I took a drink at the water fountain, which was very close to the door, and I just wanted to confirm. And that and when I took a peek in there, I saw them all shuffle back into their seats. They all shuffled back, you know, back, in, you know, they're leaning how, over. How many people? You, it was uh, there was two. Other, there was two other people in there with them. Oh, he was okay, in the center. Okay. One was on his left. One was on his right in the sauna. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Weren't you there, Eric? No, you know, I, I, I must have blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Um, it's been and even when I saw that, practice. even when I saw that, I didn't run out and go run to my manager and say he's in the sauna doing this and that. I didn't even, I didn't care. Yeah. I really didn't, didn't, I didn't give a crap. I really didn't care, you know? It, it sort of crosses your mind. It's sort of like, right. you know, like I'm a gay guy, but I've seen everything in my life. That was no shock right. to me. But don't come right. and don't come and try to, you know, don't come, on, you know, his lawyer and everything, don't come and try to put down my profession when I went to school for this and had to sit for a state board for three hours and pass a very detailed test. And you're going to make it right. look like I'm going to lie about some celebrity just to try to get some fame when I've already had so much fame from working at that hotel, from working on celebrities and being written up in three major magazines for the work I did to help people feel better. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Mm, so I, I'm, that, I'm angry at I'm angry at the Daily News for that, but I'm I'm not one to uh, keep a secret or you know or uh, you know not tell the truth. That's the God's on it, what happened, it. and it's all deep. You, there, at a book certain that point I, you felt they were they were blemishing your profession. They were that's exactly what they were doing, and the lawyer did the same thing. And I wrote that in there about his lawyer, but he don't know anything about me, and he was just trying to protect mm. his clients and to make you know a couple of you know six more figures. Onto his paycheck for that year. I'm sure. I'm sure Travolta paid him lovely to get him out of all those accusations of all those therapists because they downplayed every therapist. I guess I was the hardest one to downplay because I was the one that was only. I was the only one I think that they found that was legit. And they would. They couldn't say this is what they would really was. I really had to laugh about. They couldn't say that I was just trying to say that so I could sue him and try to make some money from my own pocket because you know why. I never worked on Travolta. So I wasn't trying to sue Travolta or out him for any financial reasons because I never worked on the guy. So I wasn't trying to make any money. I was just telling the truth. And I didn't want to have anybody downgrade my profession. I was very insulted. I had 25 good years with that profession. And I wasn't going to make some celebrity come along because of his power and his name come along and slander the people that I worked with in that hotel. Yeah, there are places to go for for that. Travolta has enough money that he could have went on Craigslist and told somebody of fantasy, some massage therapist, unlicensed, come over to my room with a massage table, I'll pay you five grand, pretend you're a massage therapist, and give me a massage, ther a massa a massage with a happy ending. He could have done his a fantasy any place, but no, he decided to come into the peninsula in a reputable place, 
which had licensed health care professionals, and try his shenanigans on our staff. And that's where I'm most insulted. And I'm also angry at the Peninsula uh, Hotel management because they knew he was doing this, and they didn't try to put a stop to it because they knew it would affect their bottom line. Because even if Travolta didn't come there and spend his money there, he has a lot of friends in Hollywood. Suppose he was friends with, say, say for example, Tom Cruise or Jennifer Lopez. He could have said to them, oh, they tried scandaling my name over there. You go over there, Jennifer? I wouldn't go back to the Peninsula Spa. Don't go to your money. Go to another, go to another place. So the Peninsula Spa would have lost millions of dollars if, John, if they went after John Travolta and said, you can't come here and do this. And they banned him. Really if they really did ban him from the hotel, the hotel would have suffered financially. So that's the reason why I don't think that the hotel put a stop to it, even though they knew it was going on all along. Wow. Well, that's the, that's well true. you're hey, interesting. Yeah, you've had a good life. Um, well, we're, we're wrapping it up, and, and I appreciate you being here. Now, uh, the two books we're talking about is Dear Pat Cooper, and the other one's Chameleon, and they're both written by our guest, Michael Caputo. Thank you for being on the show, Michael. Can you please Thanks my, so much, Michael. Can you just mention my website, michaelcaputoauthor.com? You'll see both of the books there. Fantastic. And, okay, we'll put the website up with ours so people can do one click and find you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the time that you've given me and the interview. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.